Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, I'm pleased to present to you new creepypastas for our latest creepypasta collections video. So get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. Years ago, when I was in jail, I used to pray every night. When you're little and you pray, it's because you want something from the world that you don't know how to get. And when you're older, it's because the world wants something from you that you don't know how to give. The lights would go out at 11pm, and I would pray to be a better man, humiliating myself before the arbitrary silence of my thoughts, begging and pleading and even screaming when the thoughts became too loud to contain. Then one night, an unscheduled cell search interrupted my routine. The inmates all had to wait against the wall while our block was cleared. And it wasn't until after midnight when I was able to begin my prayers. All those years, my mother used to drag me down to the church. She never once told me that God isn't the one who listens to midnight prayers. I began as I always do. I kneel on my bed, close my eyes, and with my hands clasped together, I'll ask, is anyone listening? This was the first night that someone answered. Yes. I didn't dare open my eyes, terrified that the reality of my cell would be all I saw. The voice was soft, patient, and infinitely sad, as though it had seen and heard more than its heart could bear, but had such respect for the suffering that it stoically refused to turn away. I'm afraid, I said, because I knew at once that I could not lie to such a voice. I'm afraid that I'm going to die in here, that the world has decided who I am because of one mistake, and that there's nothing I'll ever be able to do to convince them otherwise. You are right to be afraid. You will die in this cell, the voice said. My whole body went tense. For a moment I thought I was talking to a guard who was trying to screw with me. But the calm certainty of the voice was enough for me to keep my eyes closed and believe. If I couldn't have faith here and now, what hope did I ever have? But that doesn't mean that this is the end. Your body has been branded and discarded, the voice continued. Do not waste any more time trying to save what is already lost. My soul, then. Your soul is hungry to keep living, and this is how you must feed it. Find and kill a human, and then take your own life. When these eyes close for the last time, the eyes of your victim will open, and you will be looking out. The strain to look at my saviour was excruciating, but some instinctual terror forbade me. Either I would look upon some unspeakable abomination and be forced to abandon my hope of a new life, or I'd see some imposter and know it to be a lie. And if I don't like who I've become, I can kill again. I barely breathed the words. Will I become a new person each time? As many times as you like, purred the presence. When you're old and tired, taking a child will let dance this mad show again. My mind was racing immediately, disgusted but enthralled by the idea. And if I die by chance, if I'm hit by a car or something, and I haven't killed anyone yet, where will I go? That will be up to me to decide. The voice was smiling now. I don't know how, but I knew. 
I couldn't take it anymore. If this was some sick joke, then I wanted to know before I betrayed anything anymore. I opened my eyes and flung myself in a rapid dash against my cell door. There was no one on the other side. No one in the corridor which stretched open before me. The voice did not speak to me again. I have prayed to be a good man, and this is how my prayers were answered. I will become a good man, but I had to find and kill him first. Killing another inmate would be pointless. Why start life again in another cell? It had to be a guard. Someone with access to the outside, so that I could make my way out and then kill again. It took about a week for me to get a metal shiv that would be up to the job. I took my victim into the yard during the bedlam of gang squabble. He was innocent of everything, but standing next to me when the opportunity arose. And I do not wish to dwell on the incident with any more detail than that. I only had a few seconds before the other guards tackled me, but it was enough to force the shiv into my own heart. And the light bled from me and the pain dissolved into oblivion. I prayed again for forgiveness. No answer came but the welcome darkness. And the searing white light which roused me in the hospital. I wasn't shackled. There was a woman leaning over my bed, shedding tears of joy that I was alright. Her name was Mariah, and she didn't know that she was a widow now. There was a boy who wouldn't stop wailing and laughing. He didn't know his father had died on that prison yard, or that I had taken his place. Was it a kindness that kept me from telling them the truth? They were so happy that I was alive, that they readily accepted my memory loss, although I did seem to maintain some of his muscle memories and habits. It started off as guilt that made me unwilling to leave them, but guilt alone could not endure through the years as I have done. You probably wouldn't believe me if I told you I loved them as strongly as they love me. But waking up with my new wife and staying strong for my boy, I've never been so happy as that. I lived with them for five years until I suffered a minor heart attack. I felt like a ticking time bomb after that. The big one could happen any day, and this new life I had worked so hard for would be replaced by some unspeakable unknown. Giving up this new life would be the hardest thing I'd ever have to do. But I couldn't take the anxious suspense any longer. It was time to kill again, and again, and again. I wouldn't let myself get tied down like that again. That one was famous, or another had a better house, or a hotter wife. The lives were a blur, fading in and out so quickly that I became everyone and yet no one. It turns out killing people is quite easy. It's not getting caught that's hard. But since I always sacrificed my own life in the same moment, getting caught was never an issue. I wanted to experience everything that life had to offer. One day I was a schoolgirl, the next I was a professional athlete or a race car driver. Taking highly skilled people was my favourite, because with little practice and their muscle memory, I was just as good as they ever were. I spent several years as a number of prominent musicians, leaving a wake of scandals as I inevitably took my own life to move on. I don't know how many lifetimes I could have spent this way, but I never had the chance to explore them all. I was using a healthy body to experiment with a variety of drugs when I was ambushed by an undercover cop. I didn't have a chance to switch bodies again, and before I knew what was happening, I was back in jail. It was a minor possession charge, and I had plenty of money hidden away for bail, so I didn't make any fuss. The point is, 
that I saw her again at the station. Mariah was dating again. I guess she had a thing for a man in uniform. Seeing her sitting and laughing, knowing that she moved on from me so easily, it just made my blood boil. I guess I hadn't realised until that moment that throughout all the glamorous lives I'd lived over the last few years, I hadn't once been as happy as I was as when I was with her. It wasn't as easy as I thought to slip back in. I killed her new boyfriend without trouble, but she didn't stay with me long. It was as though she noticed the change right away, dumping me almost as soon as I stepped foot in her house. It took two more bodies trying to seduce her, only to be turned away each time. Frustrated, I consented to bide my time, waiting until she began dating again, so that I could replace him and have her. Three boyfriends later, the same story each time. I killed each of them, only to be rejected the moment I appeared in their body. It seemed as though she could sense my presence somehow, but each time she turned me away, I only wanted her more. It didn't help that she was becoming unstable. I hadn't counted on how psychologically devastating it must be to continue dating new people and yet sense that they are all the same. She practically stopped going outside altogether and I was going crazy trying to figure out how to reach her. You don't know how much it hurt me to tell you what happened next. This is my confession and before God and the man and otherwise, I wish my sins to be known. There was one person in her life that Mariah would never abandon, and children are always the easiest of targets. I caught him leaving school one day. He's been taking the bus since his mum started locking herself in. I was wearing the body of a policeman he'd grown up around, and he'd had no reason to suspect my intentions when I offered him a ride. I didn't drive him home though, I was taking him out into the woods where there wouldn't be a scene. Trying to get close to Mariah through her son might seem strange to you, but after living so many lives, I wasn't encumbered with such artificial distractions as romance or maternal love. I wanted to be close to her again, I wanted her to love me, and if she was too broken to love another man, then I was willing to make a compromise on her behalf. Get out of the car, I ordered the boy who was once my son. Where are we? I thought we were going home. Just get out. Those big almond eyes stared at me for a long time. Then he smiled. Okay, I trust you. We're going to play a game, okay? I've got out of the car with him. My hand was cramping up from flexing beside my gun. Okay, close your eyes. Okay, don't open them, promise me. Okay, Dad. He closed his eyes. My blood froze. Why'd you call me that? I asked. Sorry. His little brow furrowed in deep thought. I don't know. It's just that you smell like him. Only I don't feel it in my nose. Where do you feel it? The boy crossed his heart, still clenching his eyes shut. I slid my gun back into its holster. The game goes like this. You count to a hundred while I hide. When you open your eyes, you have to find me. Ready? Ready. When we finished playing, I told him to get back in the car and we drove back to his home. I didn't go in to see Mariah. I just dropped him off and didn't look back. No matter what happens from this moment on, I know this life is going to be my last. I know it doesn't mean much, but for what it's worth, I'm staying on as a cop. I'm going to protect that boy and his mother for the rest of my life. And when chance or old age takes me at last, I'll deserve whatever happens to me next. I have prayed to be a good man, and this is how my prayers are answered. 
Do you know what it's like to live without a soul? Because I do. It's like watching a romantic movie that's so perfect, you find yourself falling in love with the character. Then the lights come on, and you suddenly remember that person didn't exist. And even if they did, they would never care that you exist. It's like running the wrong way on a racetrack. It doesn't matter whether you ever finish or not, because everyone else has already crossed the line and gone home. You've run further than anyone else. Your legs are in agony, and there's a fire in your lungs, but you're still running because you're afraid of the silence when you finally stop. Living without a soul is sitting in the eye of the hurricane. Life is moving all around you, and sometimes it feels like you're part of it when it passes too close. But in the end, nothing and no one can even move you. And though the wind howls fierce in its savage glory and sweeps all the world from under your feet, you'll never know what it feels like to join that wild dance. And that's okay. You tell yourself that, at least you won't be hurt like all those other fragile humans burdened with their souls. But deep down, you wish that you could feel that hurt, just for a moment. Just so, once in your life, you knew there was something important enough to be hurt over. I lost my soul while I was only six years old. My father didn't want me, my mother told me so. She said I was the reason that he left, and I believed her. I was in first grade at the time, and our class project was to make a paper lantern which was closed at the top. The hot air from the candle was supposed to lift the lantern, although mine wasn't sealed properly and couldn't leave the ground. I was getting really frustrated, and after the fourth or fifth attempt, I got so mad that I actually ripped the whole thing to shreds. My teacher, Mr. Hansbury, a gentle dumpling of a man with a bristly moustache, squatted down next to me and gave me the lantern he had been building. I was so mad that I was about to destroy that one too. But he sat me down and said, Do you know what I love most about paper lanterns? They might seem flimsy, but when they fly, they can carry away anything that you don't want anymore. You can put all your anger into one of these, and the moment you light that candle, it's going to float away and take your anger with it. That sounded pretty amazing to me at the time. I settled down to watch him glue the candle into place concentrating all my little heart on filling the lantern with my bad feelings. It started off with just the anger at the project, but one bitterness led to the next, and by the time Mr. Hansbury was finished, I'd poured everything that I was into the paper. All the other class lanterns only hovered a few feet off the ground, but mine went up and up and on forever, all the way to the top of the sky. The other kids laughed and cheered to see it go, and my teacher put his hand on my shoulder and looked so proud. But I didn't feel much of it. How could I? With my soul slowly disappearing from view. I remember asking Mr. Hansbury if I could go home and live with him after that. But he said he didn't think my mother would like that. I told him that she would, 
but he still said no. I didn't suppose it would have mattered one way or another though, because it was too late to take back what I did. There's something else besides the numbness that comes when your soul is gone. I didn't see them the first night, but I could hear them breathing when I lay down to sleep. Soft as the wind, but regular and calm like a sleeping animal. I sat and listened in the darkness for a long while, covers clutched over my head. The breathing seemed so close, I could feel its warmth billowing under the sheets. I cried for what seemed like hours, but mum didn't come up, and I was too afraid to get out of bed. I don't think I fell asleep until it was light outside. Mum was angry at me in the morning for keeping her awake. She heard me, but she thought I would give up eventually. I didn't get breakfast that day, and I didn't mention the breathing again. That was only the beginning. I think a soul does more than help you appreciate the things around you. It also protects you from noticing the things you aren't supposed to see. And with it gone, they were everywhere. Beady eyes glinting from under the sofa, a dark flash at the corner of my eye, scuffling in the drawers, and late night knockings on the door and windows. I never got a good look at them, but they were always watching me. I'd wake up in the middle of the night and feel their weight all over my body, pinning me down. Rough skin against me, dirty fingers digging into my nose and mouth. Worse still, their touch penetrated my mind, inserting thoughts so vile that I knew they couldn't be my own. Although the longer they were in my head, the more difficult it was to be certain of that. Did I want to insert a needle into my eye and see how far it would go? Probably not. Then why could I not stop thinking about it? Were they making me think about beating my classmates into bloody pulps? Or setting fire to people's homes to watch them weep on the sidewalk? Or was that all from me? The first few nights I lie awake and cried myself but I soon learned to be more afraid of my mother than I was of the creatures. As much as I hated the shadows, they never hit me after all. I wouldn't call it living, but I continued to exist for years like that. During the day, I kept to myself, exhausted and numb. All colours seemed muted except for the glittering eyes which tracked me from unlikely crevices, all around, muffled, for their scrapings and breathings. The only time I would really feel was when I would lie awake in the darkness. But these were the times I wish I felt less. Neither screams nor silence brought any comfort from the intrusive probings, and my mind was flooded with persistent images of violence, self-destruction and despair. Over time, I found a trick to help me get through the insufferable nights. I convinced myself that my body was not my own, and that nothing it felt could do me harm. The real me was lying safe somewhere, high up in the sky inside a paper lantern. No matter what my flesh did to anyone else, that had nothing to do with me. I kept everything below the surface as best I could, until I was 14 years old. By then, I would lost the ability to distinguish the origins of my thoughts. All I knew is that I wanted to hurt someone, hurt them as badly as I wanted to be hurt in return. I picked fights at school, I pushed my classmates around, and they stayed cleared of me. I once drove a pencil into someone's hand where they weren't looking, 
grinding it back and forth to make sure the tip broke off inside the skin. I heard the creature sniggering at that, but it was a disdained kind of laugh. When I was called into the principal's office afterwards, I was surprised to see Mr. Hansbury there too. The principal was all rage lecturing me about stamping around like the Spanish Inquisition. Mr. Hansbury didn't say much. He just looked tired and sad. He didn't speak up until the principal dismissed me, at which point he put his hand on my shoulder and leaned in real close to ask, Have you looked for it? I didn't have the faintest idea what he meant. I gave him a stare that a marble statue would find cold. Your lantern, did you ever try to get it back? I told him to piss off. I'm sorry for telling you to send it away, he said, gripping my shoulder to stop me from leaving. I thought it would be easier than facing, but I was wrong. People can't hide from themselves like that. The pencil was good, but it wasn't enough. My thoughts matched the sardonic tone of the laughter, mocking me for my pitiful attempts, as the creatures crawled over me at night, and their intentions mingled with my own. I decided to bring a knife next time. I considered a gun too, but resolved that it wasn't personal enough. I'd rather look a person in the eyes when the blades slip them than shoot a dozen scurrying figures from a distance. And what happened to me afterwards? It didn't matter, because the real me was safely floating in a breeze a thousand miles away. It wasn't going to be at school this time. I wanted to take my time and not be interrupted. Instead, I went out at midnight, the taste of those dirty fingers still fresh in my mouth. I didn't care who my victim was, as long as they could feel what I was doing to them. My neighbourhood was quiet at night, and there weren't a lot of options though, so I decided to head down to the 24-hour gas station on the corner. The kitchen knife gripped between my fingers, cold air filling my lungs, groaning laughter and applause from the creatures thick around me in the darkness. I almost felt alive there for a second, just like I did with the pencil. But this would taste better. Holding the knife, I felt like a virgin on prob night, with my crush slowly unzipping my pants. I wasn't in the eye of the storm anymore. I was the storm. And tonight would be the night that I saw the paper lantern floating in the air, just a few feet off the ground. The shell was so filthy and stained that I could barely see the light inside. It was impossible for the fragile thing to have survived all these years. More impossible still for the single candle to have burned all this time. But I knew without a doubt that it was my light by the way the creatures howled. They hated it with a passion, and would have torn it to shreds if I had not gotten there first. I plucked the lantern from the air and guided it softly to the ground, the shades screeching as they whirled around me. Feral animals cowed by the miraculous flame. Holding the lantern close, I found the note that was attached. I found this in the woods. Took a couple of days to find it. Mr. H. I collapsed on the sidewalk, trembling for all the time I'd spent away from myself, blubbering and sobering like an idiot until the flame guttered out from my tears. The howling creatures reached a feverish point, and then there was silence, all rising together into the sky with the last wisps of curling smoke from the lantern. It hurt like nothing I'd felt in years. But it was a cleansing kind of hurt. I didn't hide from it. I didn't send it away. I didn't drown it with distractions or fight its grip on me. I won't go so far as to say that pain is a good thing. 
but it is undeniably a real thing, and I'd rather hurt than send it away to live with the hole it leaves behind. 11.50pm on New Year's Eve. The racious beat of the music is echoed by the pulse in my veins. Iridescent lights lance through the air all around me, and the teeming heat of pressed bodies forces me to swallow great lungfuls of heavy air, thick with sweat and cheap perfume. I can't be the only one who isn't dancing, but anyone who notices me will immediately recognise that I don't belong here. Smiles and sniggers look the same to me, and all laughter is tainted with condescending jokes at my expense. Living with crippling anxiety is my personal nightmare. Just trying to start a conversation with someone feels like standing on the roof of a tall building. One little push, and I'm free. The clenching knot in my stomach has frozen me in place. I must have started walking towards Chase at the DJ table a dozen times so far at this party, but I've never gotten within a few feet before I had the irresistible urge to check my phone, go to the bathroom, or disappear off the face of the earth entirely. Guys like Chase don't look twice at girls like me. It doesn't matter if we like all the same music. It doesn't matter if there is electricity which ignites the air between us. Maybe things would be different if he was the one to say hi first. But how was that supposed to happen when I couldn't even get close to him? Looks like you could use a drink. I don't understand how I heard the words so clearly over the pounding music, but I didn't turn to the barman. Maybe if he thought I didn't hear them, he'd give up and leave me alone. Maybe too. What's your poison? He insisted. I don't drink. I dismissed him over my shoulder. You mean, you didn't used to drink? I finally turned to see an elderly man with a closely groomed grey beard and a vest which fits so closely that it might as well have been sewn onto his skin. His dark eyes drilled into me with undistinguished fascination. You didn't used to do a lot of things, he continued. There was a time you'd never walked before, but then you started, and you haven't stopped since. Now it would be silly to say you don't walk, wouldn't it? You aren't even the same person who couldn't walk anymore. What do you mean, not the same person? A sudden lull in the music was punctured by Chase's voice on the loudspeaker. Five minutes to midnight, who's ready to burn the rest of the year? He was answered by an overwhelming cheer, but the old man's words still clearly punctured the chaos. I mean you're remembering someone else's memories. Next year you'll be new again, and then you'll remember all the memories you have now and think that they're yours. You'll have all the same habits, be afraid of all the same things because you think that's who you're supposed to be. But it's not. The new you will have to decide for herself whether she wants to keep copying a failing strategy or learn from it and try something else. I don't have a failing strategy, you don't even know me. How could I? He replied promptly. You're a blank slate tonight. Even you don't know you yet. So how about that drink? I nodded, not fully understanding why. He spoke with such a simple surety that I couldn't muster anything to refute him. The barman pulled a purple bottle from under the shelf and spun it deftly between his hands. A fountain of thick, rich liquid, like cough syrup, sprouted into a perfectly placed mug, which I hadn't noticed a moment before. What is it? Just what you need. Cheers. He poured a second glass for himself and toasted me. May we make room for new growth by pruning the dead branches, and may we leave what's dead behind. 
I took a long drink, forcing myself not to gag as the thick liquid dribbled down my throat like oil. He finished first, slamming his glass upon the table and wiping his beard with the back of his hand. Before I had a chance to finish mine, the barman added, Those who die a little each night will never feel the pain of those who go all at once. You're the lucky ones. Huh? I wiped the last of the thick residue from my mouth. It's almost midnight. Are you ready to let the old you die? Almost midnight. I was running out of time. I felt a certain tranquility while walking towards the DJ table. The old me would have turned away by now, but I didn't slow down even when Chase looked right at me. The electricity wasn't a barrier anymore. It was charging me, an exhilarating fuel which propelled me through the churning dance floor. I even allowed myself to step in time with the music, bobbing and swaying with the mesmerizing beat. It almost felt like I was flying, until suddenly I was close enough to finally say, Hey Chase. My wildest paranoia couldn't have prepared me for his reaction. Glancing up from his computer, Chase's face contorted into a horrified caricature of his self-assurance. He lurched out his chair so fast that it tumbled over backwards. I rushed to help him but that only made him kick the chair in my direction and scramble across the floor. The music was deafening this close to the speakers, but it wasn't enough to completely drown out the grotesque retching as he vomited on the floor. Through the beat, I could still clearly hear the wailing sob rising in my throat as I sprinted away from him and turned to the bathroom. I couldn't understand what happened until the burning began. My fingers gingerly grazed the swiftly swelling lumps on my face. I covered myself with my hands as I ran brutally shoving my way through the crowd and then slamming through the bathroom door. A girl in a black sequence party dress dropped her makeup and screamed. I almost trampled her on my way to the mirror, but she wasted no time in ducking under the sink and crawling towards the door. Looking in the mirror, I honestly couldn't blame her. Some of the lumps in my skin were the size of golf balls, and they were growing by the second. The larger ones were actually wriggling, almost as though there were an insect squirming just beneath the skin. More lumps were appearing on my hands, and the itching, burning, radiating down my body left no ambiguity about what was happening under my clothes. I would have screamed if my tongue weren't swelling too, but it was all I could do. Just try to keep my airway clear. Then the first boil popped, and I couldn't contain the howl which ripped from my lungs. I heard the door open, but it snapped shut immediately. I couldn't tear my eyes away from the mirror. More boils were rupturing by the second, splattering the glass with thick purple syrup, which clung on like long strands of mucus. More of them exploded in my mouth to trickle down my throat with the same oily taste of the drink. My hair was sliding from my scalp in great clumps, matted and greased with the bubbling purple liquid. The only thing which kept me from completely losing my mind was the sight of fresh pink skin which shone beneath the savage gashes in my face. The burn was growing more intense by the second, but each exploding boil revealed more healthy skin below it. I started ripping at the tattered shreds, peeling them and dumping them in a soggy pile around my feet. Beneath all the skin that was falling off, I didn't even recognize myself. My new skin was lighter and clearer, and the new hair which sprouted was a short ruffled blonde that was nothing like the long dark hair which lay in clumps around my feet. Nothing was the least recognizable, except my eyes, which were stretched wide with a familiar anxious terror. What the hell? 
Chase must have been following me into the bathroom, as those were the words that exited his mouth. How long had he been watching? Long enough. I stepped away from the wet pile of old flesh that littered the ground. My clothes were still soaked in the liquid though, and more chunks continued to rain out my dress and down my legs. He looked like he was about to vomit again. Hey Chase, I want to try something, come here. He didn't move, but he didn't have to. I crossed the space between us more quickly than I thought possible, and all at once our faces were inches apart but he didn't turn away. Outside, I could hear the countdown towards midnight. Five. I pressed my finger to his lips to silence the budding question. Four. I cupped his head in my hands and drew him towards me. Three. I felt his hard lips soften against mine. Two. The taste of his sweat as my mouth made its way down his neck. One? The squirt of blood through my teeth as they sank into his flesh. He was thrashing now, but each movement just forced my jaw to tighten until I could feel the first vertebra crunch under the pressure. All the shouts of Happy New Year drowned out his terminal scream, which strangled to a whisper when his trachea collapsed. Part of me died that night, alongside Chase, but the old man knew what he was talking about. It's much easier to leave your dead parts behind than let them weigh you down. And for the first time in my life, I'm not afraid anymore. I am at least 15 feet from the frozen shore when I hear it. The ice feels as solid as concrete, so I take another step. The Winnebago Shishish is, like most of the Minnesota Ice Out Lakes, which will remain frozen until spring. There's no chance of breaking through. At least, that's what my girlfriend Amy keeps telling me. There's a knock. I hear it cracking. We shouldn't go so far out. I hear something cracking. Is it the voice of my terrified boyfriend? I glare at her, or at least at the wandering bundle of winter coats, which has devoured her without a trace. Somewhere in my head is faintly echoing the song, I will do anything for love, but I won't do that. I can't turn it off, but I do my best to turn down the volume so I can take another step. The thick blanket of snow which covers the ice keeps me from sliding, and if I really concentrate, I can pretend I'm walking on a regular snowy field. Knock. It's just so hard, with that sound like an ephemeral gunshot deep below the ice. Reverberating echoes insidiously linger, somewhere between hearing and imagination. There isn't any reason to be afraid. But I'm trembling. It's just because it's 14 degrees outside. If you don't hurry up, I'm going to start stomping and throwing rocks, Amy shouts. Then we'll see how solid it really is. When did she get so far ahead of me? It's amazing how quickly the world can pass you by when you're staring at your feet. I scramble and slide another few shambling paces towards her. It's easier to move if I just focus on her. Don't look down. Don't look down. Don't look... And that is when I hear another knock from under the ice. I look down. My body doesn't ask for permission first. I couldn't help it. When the sound comes from directly below me, I stare down into the blank patch of ice where the snow is thinner. I stare down into the blurred blue tinged face on the other side and the hand which pulls back. But the knock doesn't come. 
This time, the hand simply presses against the underside of the glassy window. Fingers spread wide in an intimate gesture, as though inviting my touch from the other side. Seriously, dude? I'm going to freeze to death waiting for you. Eh, me? My voice is muffled from my scarf, but I can't look up from the lake. The face is coming into focus as it presses itself against the ice. Amy's skin had never been so pale, her eyes never so blue as though staring up at me from below my feet. I swear to God, if you're going to pussy out on me, then I'm leaving your ass here. You said you'd go all the way out with me. Amy, the other Amy, underneath the ice, her mouth is moving too. It isn't hard to read her lips when it's only one word. Run. You've got five seconds before I leave you here, my girlfriend shouted. Four. My knees buckle, and I tremble down to peer into the ice. The other Amy isn't exactly identical. Her clothing is different, but familiar. She's wearing the purple sweater my girlfriend had been wearing yesterday when we'd gone out skiing together. Amy, wait! I put my hands against the ice to mirror the girl underneath. She recoils immediately, her face twisting into that of desperate fear. Amy and I had been separated for about an hour yesterday when she moved onto the advanced slopes while I was practicing on the bunny hill. Had something happened to her during that time? Two. There was another knock, her fist slamming into the underside of the ice, which vibrates underneath me, then slamming again. Her movements frenzied in their urgency, her mouth straining as the silent screams ripped from her body. The muscles in my legs coil beneath me, so tense they may as well be a brooding avalanche which needs only the weight of one more snowflake to begin. One! The voice was different. It was still Amy, but it wasn't her, like comparing a black and white photo to the original. All the colour, all the life, all the flavour had been drained from the sound leaving only the barest skeleton of her voice to hang in the frozen air. Run! screams the girl from under the ice, but I can't leave her there. I clasp my hands together to raise them above my head, smashing them into the window. It feels like the bones in my fingers are rattling together from the impact. Underneath, the girl is flinging her entire body against her side of the ice. I'm giving up on you shouted the colourless voice. It sounded like it was further away, but I didn't look up. The girl below the ice is growing weaker with each stride. Her fingers are stiffing and inflexible. Her mouth is still working over the same word again and again, but each iteration comes more slowly as her jaw resists the effort. I can break through. A deep hollow crack is resonating with each blow. Flurries of snow and ice shrapnel explode in the air as I strike the ice again and again. The girl below is sinking now, but I'm not giving up until glacial waters spray from the crack. One more blow and I'm through, plunging my hand into the numbing chill to seize the stiff fingers slipping deep into the water. The skin is so hard and cold, it feels like metal, but life surges into her as she responds to my touch. She's gripping me now, and if I can just get stable footing, I'll be able to haul her out. But she pulls before I have a chance, and I'm already tumbling into winter's gaping mouth. Water so cold that it burns my skin, closes over my head. The other Amy braces her feet against the underside of the ice to pull me deeper still launching off with her legs to send both of us spiralling downwards. I can feel my eyes freezing all the way to my skull, but I can't shut them if I want any chance of finding the hole in the ice. She's still clinging to me, but a few wild kicks buy me enough space to start crawling my way back towards the surface. 
I expect my impetus to rocket me straight out the water, but my head only slams into the impenetrable ceiling of ice. Even down here, it sounds a lot like the knocking I've heard since I arrived. My wild finger probes the ice as far as I can reach in every direction. I went straight down and back up. The hole should be here. My skin rivets against the numbing darkness. The pressure in my lungs is mounting by the second. My body demands a scream, but I refuse to waste the last remnants of my precious air. I'm pulling myself along the bottom of the ice in every direction, but the strength in my fingers is swiftly fleeting. The hole is gone, the light is dying, and soon I will follow. Soon, but not yet. Fingers grip around my ankle. I'm not strong enough to kick free anymore, but another hand latches onto me and begins to drag me, and I know in my heart that it's the hand of death. Then the pull. Water rushes over me, but I can barely feel it anymore. There's a momentary pause, as the hands refocus their grip, and then pull again, dragging me deeper still. My last uncertain thought is wondering why it's growing brighter around me instead of darker. An idle curiosity of no consequence. She's pulling again, and at that moment, my legs are pierced by a sudden wind. My brain can no longer process how that's possible. Then another pull, and the water begins to pour off my body. My head is suddenly clear from the water, and I collapse onto my back on solid ground. I'm coughing and spitting up water, but a warm blanket is being wrapped around me. My eyes flutter open from the life-giving pressure, and Amy is there. Amy, in her purple sweater, perfectly dry. She's holding me to her and wailing incoherently. I must have passed out after that, but when I woke up, I was back inside her house. She said I must have been crazy to break the ice underneath me, but she ran back as soon as she saw me fall in. I was upside down in the water, but she managed to pull me out by my ankles. What on earth were you thinking? You could have died. I didn't tell her about the face under the ice though. I didn't ask her how she could have changed back to her purple sweatshirt in the middle of the ordeal. And above all else, I didn't ask her about the knocking which I still hear resounding far above my head, almost as though it were coming from another world. I don't think I'm ready to find out. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up, and consider subscribing, and hit the little bell icon for even more scary stories every day. Don't forget, that if you would like me to read your story on my channel, feel free to send it to my email or share it to my Reddit, both of which can be found in the description. Please just make sure to include as much punctuation and paragraphing as possible to maximize the chances of your story being read. But anyway, for now guys, I'm gonna sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.